Nelson, Paolo Budinic. In fact, in Italian, scuola is, uh, is feminine and uh, center is masculine. So we are sister and brother. So, and it was created uh, uh, as a plan B. So it, uh, if uh, ever ICTP wouldn't have worked, then there was another boat possible for go going on <laughs> that was CISA. So it's uh, the true story. So we discovered it uh, in the papers since we recently uh, uh, celebrated the 40th anniversary of CISA and we went back to the papers of that period of the 70s and we discovered the letter by, by Budinich <laughs> uh, mentioning CISA as a sort of a of a, of a plan B for, for so CISA is uh, international, but it is Italian. So uh, it's an eye that you can interpret in both uh, ways. So it's international and Italian. It's a PhD school. The working language is English, and we receive uh, 70 about students per year from everywhere. And uh, overall, we have 300 uh, PhDs. And in this field, we are doing a special investment uh, uh, because we got a funding from the government for the next five years. And uh, indeed, the two of them have already passed, uh, so for the next uh, three years. And uh, we already started the hiring, and we have still an open position uh, uh, for a junior position at CISA uh, that was announced uh, a few days ago. And uh, this uh, project is, is, uh, is, uh, uh, is a collaboration again with ICTP, and, uh, so, and we are working together at attracting uh, talents from everywhere and uh, uh, boost the activity in, the, in this field, which, as uh, Fernando was saying, is uh, crucial, and uh, not only for the developing world, because uh, it has to do also with development of, the, of Italy and of this region in particular, because uh, uh, it's, uh, because of the economic crisis and the smallness of the region, many companies in the region are interested in uh, supporting activities in this, uh, uh, in this field. So welcome again to uh, Trieste for those who were not be here before. The weather will not be fantastic, but uh, <laughs> you will, this will be another reason for staying here at the talks. <laughs> Okay, just uh, a couple of uh, words uh, for uh, the workshop. So, uh, as you have seen from the program, we have uh, talks uh, morning and afternoon only today. Tomorrow afternoon, uh, we will have a poster session in the corridor which runs around uh, the, um, um, this uh, lecture hall. And it will be on uh, for, the whole, uh, uh, for the whole week. Um, so, with this, I will leave... Uh, the chair to Remy to chair the first session. Okay, thank you, Matteo. Okay, so we will start this morning session, and um, the first speaker will be Marc Mézard from the Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris. Okay, and Mark will tell us about machine learning with neural networks, the importance of data structure. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank, uh, thank you to the organizers. It's always a, a pleasure to be back uh, in Trieste. Um, I am, uh, as, uh, as many people here, I, have, I am kind of obsessed by trying to understand uh, uh, why these kind of machine or much larger scale, the one that you cannot even draw on a, on a slide, are working so well. And uh, for several years, uh, I have been insisting on the idea that uh, uh, we should be able to address more carefully the structure of data, that the, that the data structure is actually crucial, that it's not a, a random task that one has to learn, but it is a very structured task and a structured data. So uh, this, uh, this means that in order to, to try to go in that direction, one needs to do several things to analyze real data in order to see what kind of structure one can find there and to try to build generative models that can be analyzed. So this second sentence here, it may be not totally obvious. It's, it's the way that uh, statistical physicists have been uh, working for many years that is trying to, to build the right 
random ensemble of models on which you can start to do theory, or in which you can start to do analysis, which goes beyond just saying, I have observed this database and I find that. I have observed that database, I find this other thing. So in order to, to go beyond that, you need to understand the mechanisms. And for that, getting the right ensemble of problem is, uh, is something which is uh, absolutely, absolutely crucial. So I will start with a, a, a few uh, remarks uh, that uh, we have been working mostly, as uh, everybody knows, the, the MNIST database of handwritten digits. So this uh, every image is an image in a space of dimension 28 square, which is 784 dimension. And um, we, will, we will have a look at uh, how this space is, uh, is built. On the other hand, on the theoretical side, we will also have a look, go back to, to old models, old problems, old modeling, in order to contrast the two. That is, I, I want first to, to contrast what happens in a real quotation mark database, if you accept that MNIST is a real database, it is kind of, let's say, at least is some, some, some database of which people have been spending a lot of effort. And what was the status of theory? And then after contrasting these two, I will tell you about how to generate some new ensemble that is closer to what, uh, what we find in, in a real database. So uh, in, the, in, in most of the theoretical work, uh, especially the one uh, done uh, in the 80s, for instance, where there was a lot of work on learning and generalization in a neural network. In, uh, in all this work, most of it was based on input patterns, the data that you feed at the entrance of a network in the, in the learning stage, let's say, or then in the analysis stage, which are IID, that is every entry is an independent random number let's say normal distribution, it could be binary, whatever. So basically the set of patterns, the data set, is a set with P patterns, each of them being a n-dimensional vector. I have just a small warning, I, I, I have no way to, to accommodate that everybody feels happy with the notation. I am using the physicist notation. For many years, for many decades, physicists have decided that the size of the problem is n. And, uh, and because of that, we have decided when we went into neural network studies that the number, the size of the database was P. So we have P patterns in N dimension. That is our database. Most statisti all statisticians are used to having a database of N patterns in P dimension. So there is a way out because we tend to use capital letters and they tend to use small letters. So you could say, that small p is equal to capital N and small n is equal to capital P. That if, that's so, if it helps you, but maybe I'm confusing you, I, I'm not sure. And anyway, I cannot do better. Uh, so uh, we, we, will, we will use, uh, I, will, I, will, we will, I will present a few experiments that we have been doing with some kind of uh, uh, what we call vanilla teacher-student models, the one that were used in the 80s which is typically a two-layer neural network with an input layer, the output, and an intermediate hidden layer. And so it means that the output in such a case depends on the input in the following way. Each neuron here, the neuron number k in the hidden layer, is doing a, a, a scalar product of the input with a vector wk. Then one applies a nonlinear function, which is a transfer function of this layer. And then one does the weighted sum of all the inputs from the hidden layer to the, to the output layer, and this gives the output. So this is the um, two-layer standard neural network, and we will use this neural network with k hidden neurons. So the size of the input layer is n, that's the number of units, the size of the image, if you want. k is the, is the size of the intermediate layer, and we have one single output in this case. And we will use it and, and study two tasks. One uh, uh, is a task, uh, two binary tasks, let's say. One is a task in which we want to distinguish, we put, as an input, we put a missed image, and we want to dis distinguish the, the, the image which are even digits and the images which are odd digits. So this will be a kind of a practical task, if you want, uh, a realistic database task. And then we have uh, something which is uh, more traditionally what has been done in the past, which is let us study that on input data, which is IID. I present 
uh, in, the, in the input, I, I take that x is a Gaussian random number. And, uh, and the desired output is given by another two-layer teacher network, which has more or less the same, which has the same kind of structure with a, an intermediate layer of size m. And the parameters here, which are omega m and nu m, which are the ones of the teacher. So you have a teacher, you feed it with some random input, it finds its output by applying this rule. And then this is the, the set of outputs that you want to learn. So this is typical of the, of the teacher-student uh, uh, model. And uh, uh, so um, we, will, we will study in this, uh, in this study, we will study the, 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 both the training error which is uh, uh, the difference between the, the task which is achieved by our network and the desired task. Uh, here we take the, the, the square error, but it could be also, I mean, there are sev several measures and the, the result do not depend much on the definition of the error that we take. And then there is another, uh, another quantity that we, that we monitor in these studies, which is if you take two different learning, you take twice the learning phase with different initial condition. I should, say the, I should say a few words on the learning. For the learning, we take the standard procedure of applying a stochastic gradient descent with this database that we have. And so we, this stochastic gradient descent, it starts from some initial condition on the weights, on these weights W and V, which are here. And you can, you can start again the learning by taking different initial conditions and see where you go. And you look at the difference, where, uh, the difference of the two, of the two uh, experiments starting from different initial conditions, and you can look at the, at the square uh, difference. So let us look at the data. Uh, this, uh, this data is uh, uh, obtained from the NIPS data. And uh, the first thing that you can look at is the blue point, the blue point which are here. And this is the generalization error after convergence uh, as a function of the, num of the size k. I remind you, k is the size of the intermediate layer. So it's in some sense the size of your, of your, of your network. And so as a function of k, you, f you find that the generalization error decreases. And uh, these are the blue points. And so the larger your network, the, the broader your network, the better the result. So far, so good. Now, uh, the thing that you can uh, look at then, which are the orange points here, the orange points is the difference uh, of the two results obtained with different initial conditions. And what you find is that basically, as soon as k is large enough that you, give a, you get a relatively good performance on these SNPs, then you find that the, two, the difference between the two uh, experiments is more or less the, of the order of the, is close to the generalization error. So it means that they are as close as they can be uh, with respect to the, to the, to the, to the target uh, network. In green, on the contrary, you look at the difference. I mean, the, the, the orange one, let me, let me make it very precise. The orange one is the error estimated the generalization error estimated on NIST images. Okay. The, green, the green one is the error, the difference between the two networks estimated by random input. So you try to understand what is the global function that has been, that has been uh, learned. And you see that in two, uh, in two trials, you find global functions which are totally different. A random choice of output would, go, uh, would put you at a distance of 0.5. So it means that basically the, the learning starting with two trials with two different initial conditions, it converges more to a function which are very similar when you look at it on the MNIST database, but as global function, they are totally different. They don't look at all the same. Now, if you do the same thing with uh, our second task, which is IID data and teacher network, uh, this, is, uh, this is what you get. You find, uh, you find that the generalization error, this is a blue, it decreases with k. And at some point, the, this is a bit special, at some point there is, if k is, this was a case in which 
the teacher network, the one with which you have generated the label, had m hidden units equal to 4, m equal to 4. So you see that when our network has a number of hidden units which is larger or equal to 4, it can make it. It just has to find the exact structure that generated the data. So it can go to zero error, and that's what is found experimentally. So the learning works well. You find the, the correct, the exact result, and this is the blue points, and the, the other blue points are covered by the green. This is actually, uh, the green points are the difference between two runs starting from different initial conditions. And here you see that what happens is that you've learned, for k larger or equal to 4, you learn exactly the same global function. So you don't have this effect of two functions which are uh, different on, uh, uh, only outside of the, of the space of uh, uh, of uh, images. So these are very, this is a strong contrast between the two situations, a kind of a realistic situation and, and the one done by, by uh, the teacher-student uh, theory. Another point that is worth mentioning is, uh, is the, the learning, uh, the dynamics. This is a generalization error after a certain number of steps of learning. And uh, this is the MNIST database this is a missed task, and you see that it relaxes to some, to some uh, asymptotic with a relaxation which does not have a special shape. Well, if you do it in the teacher-student uh, case, you will find that it relaxes to a plateau. It stays for long in a plateau. This is logarithmic scale, and then at some point decays to zero. So this, is a, this intermediate phase has been seen, uh, is ubiquitous in the dynamics of, uh, in the learning dynamics of, uh, of these um, uh, teacher-student networks, it, it reflects a state in which all the hidden units think that they will make it by themselves in some sense. And so they, they all are, are, th are thinking this is a linear, linearly separable problem and they align uh, with, the, with each other. And then at some point they start, okay, I will use a, it's a metaphor, but it's at some point they start to cooperate and to distinguish, to have different cutting planes so that you, you can uh, separate the, the data. So uh, these, uh, these are the experiments that we did to contrast, let's say, the difference between a realistic database and, uh, and the standard uh, teacher-student. And we, uh, I want to point out two facts that are clearly very different. The, the fact that two trials with uh, 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 different initial condition, learn the same function in the teacher-student and learn different functions in, uh, in, the, in the MNIST, and, and the fact that the learning phase has a plateau uh, only in the teacher-student. Uh, so let us, uh, this being said, let, let us go back to, to the, the, the structure of the data in order to try to see what, uh, what is happening. Uh, the, if you look at the input space, so it is 784 dimensional space, you have a kind of manifold of 100 digits in NIST. I mean, it's not an arbitrary image with 784 bits, it's not a digit. So you have the space of the digits. It is a kind of hidden manifold, and uh, it has been studied quite a lot. You can try to, under, of course, it's a kind of fuzzy manifold because uh, when it is a digit or not, you can have some kind of arbitrariness. But basically, looking at the database, you can get an idea of the intrinsic and the internal dimension of this manifold. It's not a linear manifold, actually. It's a much folded manifold uh, in this uh, 700 and something dimensional space. So one way to try to understand the, the, the distance uh, the, 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 the dimension of the manifold is to look at the nearest neighbor distance. If you, take, uh, 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 if, you, if you look at the number of points inside a certain ball, you, of course it should, uh, it should increase with n to the d, where d is the dimension of the space. So it means that the nearest neighbor distance should scale like n to the minus 1 over d. d is the dimension of the manifold of 100 digits, and n is the number of examples that you are looking at. This has been studied quite a lot. I mean, this idea of looking at nearest neighbor distance, it probably goes back to Grasberger and Procaccia, maybe before that, I don't know. Takens, I think, was also working with that at that time on, uh, on strange attractors. And many people have been looking at it uh, recently. Uh, it works uh, uh, relatively well. And um, uh, what you see is that, for instance, if you look at NIST, uh, the fit 
which was found, found several times and uh, more carefully even uh, recently, tells you that the effective dimension of the manifold of handwritten digits is around 15. Yet, so it means that really among all the inputs that you could look at, that you could free, feed your system with, the only inputs that should matter are the ones which are in the hidden manifold of handwritten digits, this 15-dimensional subspace. If you get out of that, actually the, the network, if, it, if we were in a nice world, the network should be trained to say, look, this input, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't, it doesn't get anywhere close to my hidden manifold. That's not a handwritten digit. I don't want to give you an answer. Okay? That's what it should happen if you feed it with this or that. So um, now you can look, there is another structure of manifold which is interesting, which is a task. So far I was defining what I call the world, which is the space of the data. This is the space of handwritten digits. Now the task. Among the, in, within the space of handwritten digits, I have 10 subspace, one associated with it, each digit. So there is a subspace of all the deformations of the five. And again, you can look at the dimension of this, of this space. And uh, this was done, for instance, by Hein and Odeber uh, back in, uh, in 2005. They found a, a dimension around 12. They had very different ways of uh, computing the dimension, but they are rather consistent. So you see that the dimension of the digits, actually, it varies quite a lot between the digits. The one is a simple seven dimension subspace. And the three is a 13 dimension subspace. Okay, that's the life of the one and the three. Uh, this is a, so basically the MNIST problem, if you think of it as a geometry in a 784 dimensional space, it is within this space you have a manifold of dimension 15. And within this manifold of dimension 15, you have 10 sub-manifolds with dimensions varying depending on the digit between 7 and 13. And you want to distinguish them. This is a geometrical, okay, that's one aspect of the geometrical structure of the data. Of course, the problem is that, the problem is that you are, a phrase like that, it seems very easy. The problem is that all this is hidden because what you have access to a priori is only the 784 dimensional space. So, uh, I should have quoted initially the, the, the work, all what I have been saying so far is done with uh, Sebastian Gold, Florence Zakala, and Lankas de Borova. Two of them are here the, so they can correct my mistakes. Uh, and, and so uh, to, all together we did this, uh, this analysis of the difference between NIST and standard teacher student. And we decided to, to, to create a new ensemble of, uh, of data that has um, uh, some features which are much closer to the one of the, of the MNIST. And uh, we call it the hidden uh, manifold model. And here is how it is described. Basically, we will, we will build the, the input space, the data space, the hidden manifold space as follows. We have a certain number of features, FR, we have R features, which are vector in the input space. They are configuration of the initial image. And then what we will do is that we will do a superposition of these features with certain weights, CR. And from this superposition here, what we do is that we apply a nonlinear function. So if we were just, if this function f was linear, then we would be constructing the data in a linear subspace of the initial space. That is kind of interesting, but totally trivial in some sense, because all the dynamics orthogonal to this linear space is trivial. And, the, and basically, you can, you can look at what happens by projecting only inside the subspace, and you get back to the old uh, teacher-student uh, framework. What is much more interesting is when you take a linear subspace generated by these features, you do a, a, a linear superposition of the feature, but then you fold that by a nonlinear function. So uh, this, is a, this is a generation of the data. This is, the, this is a sp the space of the data. Now we have to define what is the task. 
uh, oh, sorry, in practice, what we have been using is using coefficients and features which have uh, random normal entries. And we tried several nonlinear functions from extreme nonlinearity, where, where f of x is a sign, to uh, rectified linear function. Doesn't matter. I mean, the phenomenology of what I show you, it does not matter much on the, on the choice of the function itself. Now, here is the task. So uh, again, the data was defined by that. So a, a data point was really defined by its, what we call it the latent representation, which is a set of this coefficient that will define what, where is it located in this, uh, in this uh, intrinsic manifold. And so what we have looked at are, are problems, tasks in which the desired output depends on the position in this latent manifold. And so it depends on, on, the, on this coefficient CR. And we have looked at various functions. And because we are, we are not so much imaginative, we have looked at functions which are of the type that we, that we have been using for many years in, 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 in machine learning. In per, so either the perceptron-like function or something which would be a kind of two-layer function. But the crucial point is that when, whether it is the first function here or the more elaborate here, so the second one, they apply to the latent representation, that is, to the space of the dimension within the manifold, the one that you don't know. So the, the, the task of learning, you will know only the x and the desired output. You don't know the CR, of course. So this is the whole, the whole problem of learning will be to, in some sense, unfold the, this, this manifold, so that in the end, with this unfolding, you get a kind of linear perceptron-like problem that you can learn easily. That is the whole task of, of what, uh, what one should do. This kind of a geometric uh, uh, um, uh, reasoning about, uh, about what is taking place has been, has been looked at. For instance, Stefan Mala is one of the people who has been advocating that for, for several years, trying to understand exactly how deep network gradually from layer to layer are unfolding and kind of rectifying the, the a folded manifold structure until you get, it has to be like that because in the very last layer, you do linear separation. So it just means that you have unfolded the thing until you, have, you make it flat. So this is the ensemble that we are generating. Uh, Oops, sorry. Uh, one point that I should mention, it's, uh, it's a kind of, it's not a detail, but uh, it's become, it gets a bit technical. If you look at the task, uh, this task here, so you have the, the coefficient, the latent coefficient, you apply a linear function to them, a nonlinear non transfer function, and you have an, a linear weight of all of them. That could be the desired task. This desired task, if you think of it, it depends on the, the, the dot product of Wm times C, where Wm and C live in a R-dimensional space. The R-dimensional space is the space of the latent representation. So if the number M here is less than, sorry, this should be R, if M is less than R, then we have an invariance in the sense that if we shift C in a direction which is transverse to all of the, of the vectors Wm, the output is unchanged. So this is what we call the perceptual submanifold. It tells you that for one given output, you have, a, you have a degeneracy, which is, you have an orbit. It's like the orbit of the, of the digit number five that I was taking, talking about. And the dimension of this orbit is R minus M, and it can be monitored by, by choosing various values of the size of the, of the hidden manifold and, the, and, and this number M here. So this, is, so this is the experiment that, uh, that we did for this, uh, for this problem. This, uh, on the right, I remind you of the MNIST database. Here is a learning and generalization as function of k. Uh, this is a generalization error. So the blue is, uh, the, blue is uh, the standard generalization error. The, the orange is the difference between two runs of, uh, of our uh, neural network with uh, stochastic gradient descent in the case where the data is generated by the hidden manifold model. You see that when you compare the two runs, 
on the structured data, on the, str on the data which is really within the hidden manifold, we get the same result as NIST, that is the, the, two, the two networks agree on this, net, on, this, on this data. But if you compare the global function, that is you, you, you put some random input and you look what it gets out in one case and the other, well, you find uh, that, that the, the random, the, it, it implements very distinct function in the two cases. So this is uh, the same phenomenology as we had when we were doing the NIST. Then we can look at the, we can look at the plateau. Uh, this was the relaxation for the NIST, and this is the relaxation that we find for our model with the hindered manifold. So the, 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 the famous plateau that was existing, the blue here is the stand, is, is a vanilla uh, teacher-student model with this plateau and so on. It has disappeared and we have some standard relaxation, let's say, much uh, closer to what we get when we do the, when we do the, the learning, the learning with the NIST. So uh, the conclusion is that this model here does not have the pathologies of the teacher-student setup with IID uh, data. So I think that it is, a, it is a, a probably a valid model to start to work on uh, uh, much more carefully. It seems to have uh, learning and generalization phenomenology quite close to the one that we get at least in NIST. It's also a model that can be studied analytically. I, I would have dreamed to tell you about the analytical solution today, but uh, my collaborators here and me, we are still working on it, and we have to, we, okay, we'll come back for the next conference and tell you about the solution of this model. I think it, quite a lot can be done, actually. Um, let me, if I have uh, uh, five more minutes, let me uh, tell you, um, sorry, one uh, comment about uh, another aspect uh, of this uh, structured data, um, which is a, a computation that I did a couple of years ago about the Hopfield model. So this is different. I will not tell you about learning and generalization, but I, will, I want to tell you, going back to this um, old model uh, of uh, statistical physics, in some sense, of disordered system, which is the Hopfield model, try to see what happens if you plug in some structured data into it. So the Hopfield model, for those of, of you who don't know it, it's a model of uh, easing spins. I will, I will be very fast in the description. And uh, in this model, what you want to do is memorize a certain number of patterns. So in the, in the standard Hopfield model, you, gener you want to memorize IID random patterns. Okay, as usual, most of the, of the science was, or the statistical physics was done with the IID input. And so the idea is that you have a, a, an ensemble of spin system interacting by pairs with a, a coupling constant JIJ. And, uh, and Hopfield proposed to use the Hebb rule, which is to, to study the case in which this JIJ, the coupling matrix between the spin, is a superposition of the product psi mu, psi j mu for the various patterns. And then you can look at this problem. You can study the, the Boltzmann equilibrium with the partition function. This has been done. One thing specifically that I wanted to understand is the mean field equation that describes this problem at equilibrium. These are called TAP equations. And uh, the simple thing that you could write are the TAP, these, these mean field equations, they are, they are well known. They relate the local field HI on a certain spin. They are the mean field approximation, but they are exact in this case. They are supposed to be exact because it is a, an infinite range model. And so this, the, the ones which have been uh, written by TAP, they relate the local field on the HI. It's the sum of the field due to the neighbors. Tanch beta HK is a magnetization of the neighbor number K, weighted by the coupling, and there is an Ansager reaction term. That is a standard TAP equation for the SK model. If uh, they, this takes into account, this reaction term takes into account the Onsager reaction, which is that I can polarize J, which can back polarize upon I. So you have to take that off. Now, if you take that off, you subtract this term and you get the right tap equation for SK model. The case, SK model is the case where JKI are IID without structure. Here we have a JKI which has a structure. It has this superposition of the patterns. So it means that this is wrong because it's wrong because you have some other path of reaction. I can polarize J, can polarize K, which can polarize I. 
because the, the, the couplings between IJ, JK, KI, they are correlated. So because of this correlation, you have to take into account these circuits. And the, the right way to do things is really to disentangle the, 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 the partition function of the SK model by introducing auxiliary variable. It's just a simple hubbard Shratanovich transform. And you can write the Hopfield model by saying it's, it's a, a set of spins, SI, which interact with a set of auxiliary variable, lambda mu. The lambda mu have to be interpreted as a projection of the system on pattern mu. And so you have Gaussian variable lambda mu. You see here, they have an intrinsic Gaussian measure. And the SI and lambda mu, they interact through the pattern. So this is a nice representation, well known for, for many years. And so in this case, if you, you can look at it this way, you have the spins, they are the green ones here, and you have the, the, the projection onto the pattern, the lambda mu here, and they interact. And the interaction, they are the, these squares. And you can start to do all the, mechaniz all the, the, the mechanism of, uh, of mean field equations on that. You write the belief propagation. You uh, understand that it is a fully connected model. You can simplify the belief propagation, go to the TAP representation, and you get the TAP equation, which are written here. They have been written long ago. There have been a few debates on that, but they are perfectly correct. And they can be used as an algorithm if you iterate them correctly. Now, if you look at the same problem with structured pattern, that is, in this case, I will look at pattern, which is, again, the superposition of features. And so, but, but uh, in order to have a tractable uh, solution, I will look at the very simple case in which I don't do the nonlinear folding. So I'm really in a kind of baby model. I'm sorry, it's uh, uh, much simpler than what I was saying before. My, my manifold of data is a linear manifold. Let us look at what happens if I want to study the TAP equation in this case. Uh, the, so the, the, the partition function, again, it implies uh, 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 here a disentangling between the, the, the neuron, the spin variable, the auxiliary variable, which are the projection of the pattern. And again, I can do a second Hubbard Stratonovich transformation. Don't look at the formula, but believe me, I mean, when I have structured patterns, the thing that I have to do is to introduce a third set of auxiliary variables which are related to the features. These features which are the basic objects from which I build the patterns. I build a pattern as a superposition of features, and then with the pattern I build the coupling of the Hopfield model. And basically what happens is that I have a set of spin variables, I have the variables which are the projection on the patterns, which is really how the network is working. Is it close to a pattern or not? And then I have this intermediate layer, which is the projection on the features. And it turns out that the TAP equation, they have to be written as message passing equation on this graph, in which I have a, a, a graph with three layers, spin, features, patterns, which are exchanging messages. The TAP equation, they can be written. I'm not sure, I did not write them. I didn't dare because it was a bit scary, uh, but you can, you can, uh, you can write them, and, uh, and the thing which I find quite uh, uh, interesting in all that is the, is, is the very structure of what you get. That is, you get that really the messages that are exchanged in the TAP equation, they go from this layer to the layer which is the finest structure, which is the structure of the feature, and then to the, to the, to the structure of the pattern. And, and of course, one thing that you can immediately do if you are at least a physicist, it becomes very natural, uh, is to say, well, but let's look at something which is a bit more sophisticated, in which a pattern is built as superposition of feature, but the feature itself is built as superposition of other sub-features. If you do that, then you will have to introduce another layer here, which will be the sub-features. So we'll have the initial pattern, the, the main input, the sub-feature, which are the really coarse, the, the fine grain uh, uh, structure, and then the feature, and then finally, what, what pattern you are close to or not. This is something which to me is, is, is very evocative in some sense of, of what is happening if you look at how a deep network is working. I mean, you look at a deep network for face recognition, and you look at what the, what the neurons uh, uh, what the units are doing in the various layers. And you know very well that in the first layers, you have uh, 
the, a, a given neuron will be sensitive to, a, it will be a kind of local edge detector. Very, if you look at the, the kind of input to which it reacts most. And then you go deeper and you find that you find some, some neurons which starts to be sensitive to something a bit more structural, which looks like an eye or lips or ears or whatever. And only in the very end, you get the global structure and it tells you this is your grandmother. So this is how, how it evolves in the, when you go deeper and deeper into the structure. And um, of course, it is related to the fact that when you want to understand a, a face, you are typically in a case in which the data has this kind of combinatorial structure. It is a face is composed of elements, which are composed of sub-elements, which are composed of sub-sub-elements. And so I think that this is one of the major uh, challenges uh, for us, uh, uh, which is uh, to, to, to build and understand ensemble of problems in which instead of having purely IID random things or maybe Gaussian correlated, we have something which is much more structured. And the structure, it has to have this combinatorial structure. I think that really, if you think about it, all the elaborate tasks on which we are using the deep network, whether it is language analysis, which are, it is image analysis, and so on, they have this same combinatorial structure. Language is typical also, you have a combinatorial structure. So this, what we have uh, done uh, so far, are really, in some sense, first steps in this direction. We want to have a good generative model that we can also study for that. Uh, there are many aspects. The, uh, the one aspect is a combinatorial structure. The other aspect is a, is a hidden, if you, I go back to the, to the learning phase, is a, is a hidden structure of the manifold, which becomes very complicated to find if the manifold is folded. Finding a linear submanifold is a trivial task. Finding a folded submanifold is something much more complicated. But I think that we are, we are on the way in this direction, and that is, at least in my opinion, one of the important directions to go if we want to understand one day why uh, the deep networks are so uh, powerful in a practical database. Thanks a lot.